So let's get started on these slides because you're not here really for the slides. You're here to hear Brian speak tonight. So welcome everybody for coming out tonight. I saw a few new faces. So we always mm -hmm. enjoy having new people join us. This is one of the th reasons why we do this and why we have it open and virtually to anybody around the globe. So uh, it doesn't matter if you're in Southwest Florida or on Space Coast side of Florida. Um, you could be in a whole different area code outside of Florida or in a whole different country uh, to join us. So we appreciate anybody who shows up. So this is Southwest Florida InfoSec community, otherwise known as SwiffleSec. We are located along the Southwest Florida Gulf Coast around the Naples, Fort Myers area. We're also called the DEF CON Group DC 239 and recognized as a DerbyCon community group for those of you who are old school and remember DerbyCon. We're also co-hosting with Space Coast InfoSec community or Space Coast Sec located along Space Coast of Florida out of Brevard County. We're also DEF CON Group DC321. So here I'll take a quick pause if anybody wants to whip out their phones and, and scan these QR codes. They're not at all malicious. <laughs> uh, anyway, there are our websites and uh, social sites for SwiffleSec. I haven't got the QR codes and also they, did, they wouldn't all fit on here anyway uh, for Space Coast Sec. But pretty much they're the same. Uh, we use the same handles across all the social platforms. We were lucky enough to grab them all. So you can find us either way. And then our charity of choice, which is the Innocent Lives Foundation. If you've never heard of the Innocent Lives Foundation, they work to remove CSAM or child sexual abuse material off of the internet, uh, including de-anonymizing child predators and bringing uh, evidence to law enforcement so that then the law enforcement can escalate that to a court case. So they, that's why they're our charity of choice. I think last time I spoke with them, they were at something like 600 plus cases mm -hmm. Uh, out of which um, a few hundred of those have already been turned over. They had enough uh, evidence to turn over. And then it's a smaller number that have already gone to trial. So they're doing great things to help protect our children. Uh, if you're interested in them, check out their website too. They have a lot of tips for parents and keeping their children safe and just keeping safe in general on the internet. Um, so I will move ahead then. Uh, again, I will, if you missed it, I will be dumping links uh, into our chat uh, after I turn it over for the presentation tonight. So if you missed any of the links that happen to show up on these slides, no worries, they will become available shortly. So there are several tech groups uh, available or running, or however you want to say it, uh, on Southwest Florida side, as well as on the Space Coast side. I have not <clears throat> captured them all, uh, but this is a good sampling of them. So I'm going to skip over Tech Alliance. We'll come back around to them here in a moment. But there's Space Coast Sec, that's our icon, Southwest Florida Sec. And then we have OWASP of Bonita Springs. And if you're interested in VR and AR, VR and AR of Southwest Florida, they have a meetup coming up, I believe. So anything alternate reality, we'll just say say that because I like this. Sometimes I'll go through all the realities, but there's just too many realities anymore. Because uh, you think virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality, mixed reality, it's all of the realities. So go ahead and check them out. Southwest Florida coders, they are probably the oldest group in Southwest Florida. And due to that, they have a large membership and probably at least every language is known by somebody that is in their membership. So if you have a programming question about some uh, esoteric language out there, they probably have somebody that knows the answer or at least can help you out. They have a meetup uh, generally every month now too. Uh, I know Megan mentioned one earlier, um, or no, actually that's gonna be for the Tech Alliance, which we'll get, get to in a moment. There's also Python. So there is uh, Python Southwest Florida as well as Python South Florida or Pi Ladies, sorry, South Florida. Uh, both groups operate simultaneously uh, out of the area. Space Coast Cyber, who is a company here in Brevard County, they do CMC, CMMC auditing and training, and they sponsor the social meetup. So that's coming up next Thursday at Intercoastal Brewing Company here in Melbourne. And then there's Southwest Florida Data. So anything data related, whether that's data lakes, data swamps, data warehouses, big data, data in ML, AI, um, data privacy, data security, all the things data, uh, check that group out. Again, this is just a sampling. There are several more groups uh, in both co on both coasts. It's just I didn't grab all their stuff and we have limited time to talk about every single group. 
upcoming events. So most of these groups are on Meetup. And these are the links. And like I said, these are gonna, gonna be the ones that I dump into chat. So no worries to try and capture all these. But for the most part, most of these uh, meetups occur at least once a month. There are some exceptions like OWASP Winita Springs, which only meets the first Tuesday of the first month of each quarter. So their next meetup will be coming in July, but it won't be July 4th because that happens to be the first Tuesday. So we're gonna move it to the next week. And then uh, same thing with OWASP South Florida. I think they're only meeting currently, only meeting quarterly currently. And then you've got your professional groups like ISSA and ISACA. So check their pages out for their times and meetups. So I mentioned Space Coast Cyber again, 27th of April, that's next week. Um, yeah, I think that's next week. It's 6 p.m. Eastern at Intercoastal Brewing Company. It's a family-friendly event, so come on out if you're in the area or willing to commute. Have a few brews, have some food, and just enjoy the company. Other upcoming events in the area. Uh, so there are other uh, DEF CON groups here. Uh, these, there are several that have uh, spun up in South Florida. This is just one of them, the DEF CON Group 305. Their social meetup is coming up on May 2nd at 5 to 8 p.m., and... There's their website and where they're gonna meet up. At. Of course, there's also two board conferences coming up here soon with Secure Miami coming up first on the 4th of May in 2023 at Florida International University. It is a one day conference uh, on the campus. If you haven't been to it, it's a, it's a nice cozy conference, generally one track all day uh, in a very large conference room. Um, and they have food and drinks and some vendors around the outside unless they've changed things since last time I've been there. But uh, if you're in the Miami area or willing to commute, again, uh, that conference is coming up and it doesn't cost very much to go to. Hack Miami 10 or Hack Miami X is coming up May 19th through the 20th at Marina's, uh, Marina's uh, Beach Resort. So check them out too. A little bit later in the month, they are two days because one day is for training and then the other day is in speaking tracks. So here's where I take a pause so you can get a rest from hearing me talk and it's time to turn it over to you all. Are you looking for a job? Are you seeking to hire somebody? Do you have other needs? This is your time. I'm going to take a pause now and feel free to unmute and speak up. Hey, real quick. Uh, so I had a student I was working with out of like Baron Collier uh, High School. He He's an exceptional programmer, like 16, 17 years old. Um, and he, he basically needs to use me and my authority and status and titles to kind of leverage himself in his own work, unfortunately, because he's so young. And he recently developed... Python script that analyzes healthcare data of individuals and creates training sets and epochs and has like a 90% accuracy to determine heart risk um, from the data that he, he's been working with. Um, so he wants to start to explore cybersecurity and his programming skills. Um, while I'm helpful and I can help him, I think there's other experts out there that can help guide him um, or help further his own networks than just me. So if you if you are interested or would like me to network that said student and yourself um, through my mediation, that would be great. Um, but he's looking for more projects to take on and where he can take his work next. Um, uh, I'll put my email in the chat too if you want to reach out. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, feel free to reach out to David if uh, you're in a spot that you can help. Uh, hey, uh, Capri here. I don't, I don't usually talk this soon. Normally I, I kind of just talk later with other people, but I have a friend who's looking for um, kind of entry level. He had gone to a sort of like hybrid uh, high school, like trade school kind of thing for some computer repair work, but he never really found a job in it. And now he's kind of looking for one. He's not the most experienced. So I know like some of the jobs that you all have, you know, are much higher up than he would be qualified for, but maybe someone has an idea of where he could potentially look around probably the Melbourne area. Thanks, Capri. So anybody yeah. that can help out Capri, feel free to reach out to her in chat. Yeah, I can um I can send his or post his contact information in the chat. He's uh he's just a friend of mine. He's um well, you know how it is. <laughs> Sure. Appreciate it. I can go next if that's okay. Yeah, definitely. So basically what I do on the side, I also recruit for Luciana Technology out of uh, Tampa. So basically that would be SOCOM. So if anybody or if we know anybody in here that has a TS SCI, I know that's a tall ask and it's kind of like a unicorn. Um, I can get them plugged in either in any of the SOCOM locations. So I, I don't know if this is okay to say, but like I can place them 
pretty much like Tampa, the Panhandle, Bragg. I have some roles out in California. So if you have anybody that is looking for those kind of roles, let me know. As well as I also have, have a lot of connections within the DOD space. So if you have folks that are wanting to go into the DOD space that maybe have their CompTIA Sec Plus and say they don't have a clearance, I can put them in the I can put them in the room with the people that can get them a clearance. Um, I'm not promising the best locations though. Um, it, it's what I tell my folks all the time is though, get your clearance, get six months to a year, and then go anywhere you want to go. So if that kind of speaks to anybody in here or speaks to anybody or any of your connections, please feel free to reach out to me and I can help out. Well, thanks, Lewis. I, can you put your, if you haven't already, can you put your contact information? Oh yeah, uh, in the chat? for sure. I can do that. Okay, thanks. All right. Since nobody else is jumping on right away, I'll go ahead and, uh, um, interrupt for a moment and say that I work for a medical device manufacturer based out of Southwest Florida in Naples, and we are always hiring in the tech uh, ecosystem. So whether that's business analyst, uh, software QA, uh, infrastructure, whether it's networking, storage, virtualization, et cetera, uh, we generally always have some positions open because we are a high growth company. When I say high growth, we're in the double digits of organic growth. Uh, unlike what the talks about tonight for mergers and acquisitions, so we're still in the in the organic growth stage, and uh, because of that, uh, we're always looking to grow our teams. And that website is going to be careers.arthrex.com, and I will dump that into chat as well for anybody interested in taking a look at what opportunities that we have open. So with that, I'll turn it back over. Is there anybody else who has? Uh, has a need, whether you're seeking hire, seeking a job, or other forms of needs. Hi, this is uh, Shannon. Um, I am seeking entry level role, um, studying now for my SEC Plus um, certification. And I'm happy to report that in three weeks, I'll be graduating with my MBA from Texas Women's University. Um, so making a career transition from talent acquisition over to cyber. So I'm open to sit here on the Melbourne area. I'm open um, just across the board just to sink my teeth in and, and grow. So I'll put my LinkedIn information as well. Excellent. You're, you're tired of recruiting all those high priced security people, right? It's funny. I was an executive search consulting, yes. <laughs> so now to be on the other end of it is wonderful, but also um, just fun because I kind of feel like I'm a, a new school kid essentially coming out. Um, but yeah, just excited. Congratulations yeah. on the NBA. It's awesome. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. I'm ready. <laughs> and also now you know all the tricks. So when the headhunters <laughs> come after you, you'll know exactly what their approach is all about. Exactly. I just need the, the experience now. So I'm waiting. I'm like, oh, the, so anyone who needs interview tips, let me know. I'm happy to help. <laughs> Perfect. We're always looking for folks who can help out with interview tips, resume writing tips. Uh, we get questions for that occasionally. Awesome. Happy to share my LinkedIn information and, and help out wherever I can. Great. Thank you. All right. One more time. Anybody else that has a uh, need? All right. Well, if you don't want to voice it, feel free to drop it in chat as well, and we'll continue to move on. Thanks, everybody. So before we turn it over to our speaker tonight, I want to just take this moment to uh, give thanks because otherwise we get to the end and we tend to forget because we move on and, and uh, get on other subjects. Sorry, I had to admit another person. So uh, Space Coast InfoSec community and Southwest Florida InfoSec community want to thank the following. want to thank Instant Lives Foundation for all the work they do to protect our children and remove predators off the internet. We want to thank tonight's speaker for sharing their time and knowledge with us and our members, of course, without which Space Coast SEC and Civil SEC would not be successful at all. It's because of you that we keep doing this. So as long as you all keep attending, we will keep doing this month after month and uh, looking to eventually expand even too. So we're going to have some exciting announcements coming out over the next few months uh, talking about how we're going to be expanding and doing more outreach. So watch for that. The Southwest Florida we want to thank also the Southwest Florida and Space Coast community organizations who selflessly operate to lift others. Uh, all of us do this, all of the community organizers here that I know of, uh, that I'm involved with, whether it's on the Southwest Florida side or here on Space Coast now, uh, we're doing this out of pocket. We're doing it to help the community uh, by lifting others. We, we all rise and that's, that's, that's the solid belief and we want to make sure that everybody can be successful. Uh, so we just want to give thanks to, to all of the communities who do this. Uh, we appreciate you all. And with that, um, Brian, I am going to turn it over to you. So give me a second. I will stop sharing and allow sharing for you. Okay, great. I will share my screen. All right. You should be good to go. Okay. Assuming everyone can see this all right. Okay. 
Great. Well, hey, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's it's really a fantastic opportunity to to speak to community groups like this, and um, I welcome really welcome this opportunity. Um, happy to chat with you on LinkedIn, um, and uh, it's pretty much like you know my Facebook. I don't I don't really do a lot of social media, so hit me up in LinkedIn if you'd like to connect. Um, so I'm Brian Kissinger. I'm Tracery CISO. Um, and I lead up our um, security solutions business that's customer facing. Um, I've been doing information security for over 20 years. Um, I got out of the military and I started a long, long time ago at Arthur Anderson. Uh, so that'll date me quite a bit. Um, but I uh, worked between, um, you know, professional consulting firms like PricewaterhouseCoopers and uh, CISO at, at a couple of big healthcare companies. Um, and I came over to Trace3 about three and a half years ago. You may not have heard of Trace3. Um, it's a rapidly growing technology business. Uh, we're about two and a half billion um, in revenue, national um, company um, with about 1,200 employees. Um, and Megan Guth and I um, work together um, in our security solutions practice. So I'm happy to take questions about Trace3 later on. Um, so mergers and acquisitions is a huge topic um, that we're having a lot of customer conversations um, with about today. Um, it's often um, an area of information security that is neglected. Um, and uh, so I have customers that don't have any information security or cybersecurity um, role in the mergers and acquisitions uh, strategy and set of activities. And then I have some customers that actually have an entire security team that just focuses on mergers and acquisitions. And so it sounds like, you know, our, our gentleman from, um, from, uh, oh God, now I'm blanking on it, um, w worked as part of that team as well. Um, so um, it, it kind of spans the gamut. So I'll just uh, jump right in. I'm going to talk, uh, and I'm not going to kill you with a PowerPoint. I think there are eight or nine slides here, um, and then I, I, I'm happy to take questions or comments along the way, or we can do it at the end. Um, but just uh, I'll pause uh, at each slide, um, and we can we can dialogue around it. Um, so I'm going to talk about the key challenges, um, a little bit about M&A, the overview uh, of that process. If you're not real familiar with it. What are some of the major considerations, some of the threats to manage, and then just recommendations at the end? Sound good? All right. Off and running. Sounds great. So um, I, I always like to start with something that's a little bit factual. Um, so uh, the company Forescout, who, who's a pretty major NAC player, um, released a survey not long ago that said 53% of their respondents stated that their organizations encountered a critical cybersecurity issue during the M&A process, which imperiled the deal negotiation. So I'll just let that sink in for a second. That, that right there, if I said nothing else in this entire presentation, would really underscore the importance uh, of having the information security team involved in, in the M&A process when over half of the organizations polled said that they encountered uh, a major issue. Pretty, pretty incredible. So what are some of the key challenges that that organizations face? Well, I'll talk about four of them and, and there are probably others. So uh, M&A activity is, is typically driven because there are synergies to be gained between the two companies. Um, the acquirer and, and acquiree typically can um, take advantage of cost efficiencies, growth opportunities, you know, grab extra market share. However, you know, while those are great business drivers, they also may lead to conflicts um, with some of the security paradigms that, that we're used to enforcing by either party. And so often the security teams are not involved at all or early enough in the due diligence process. And, and that often leads to surprises or rushed evaluations that that create a situation where you're too late to influence the deal makers. And, and later on, I'll, I'll tell you some some personal stories about um, not being involved in the deal team and then being involved in the deal team and and how that um, you know really changed the complexity um, of of those uh, activities. 
Second challenge is that M&A transactions are very disruptive. Um, you know, after the close um, of the deal, there, there are usually a lot of technical changes that are coming down the pipe. And that includes things like um, having an acceptable security environment. Um, and that when you connect this new technology environment, there are often either conflicts, new exposures, or gaps in control coverage. Sometimes the acquiree company is better than you are from a security perspective, but my experience has been that most of the time the organization that you're looking to acquire is not as mature and, and often um, jeopardizes the security of your program. Third one is that thinking you, you know really deeply about the close of the transaction. Usually, you know, even in the short term, you have to maintain those security controls in three separate operating environments. Usually there are going to be applications and parts of the infrastructure that you're sunsetting. There are things that are future state that you're going to build together. And then there's that transition process that you're you're working together as you actually integrate the two companies. So these additional environments really add a lot of complexity and overhead that most security teams are not staffed up for, and they really haven't thought about um, or have the experience to manage. And then the last of the, the four key challenges is that uh, really the, the human side of it, the employee side of it. So there's a lot of secrecy usually surrounding an M&A deal. And, you know, it leads to a lot of employee anxiety and uncertainty. So, you know, whether you're on the acquire, acquirer side or inquiry side, um, employees may feel like their job is at risk. I am I going to be, you know, out as part of one of these cost efficiencies? Or am I going to get a new boss that I'm not going to like? And so that really presents an opportunity for rogue um, or damaging employee actions. Um, or worse, you know, loss of key employees. So um, you really have to think about as an organization and as a security team, um, what is that human factor? You know, you have to stay very close to your colleagues and both the acquiree and, acquire, and acquirer teams to make sure that you're not losing key employees, that people feel confident in their roles and that they're not going to go off and do something that could jeopardize the deal. So let me pause for a second. Any questions or comments on the challenges? Yeah, I want to jump in on one question, and I, I think it's sort of maybe answered by number four. Um, but where do you see things like during emerger, mergers and acquisitions, um, the idea of protecting against or being being more or having a heightened awareness of insider threat? Yeah, if you don't mind, I would love to stick a pin in that one and talk about it a couple of slides down sure. because it, it is a very good observation. Um, there are definitely some considerations that you'll want to make around super users and people that have, you know, sort of extraordinary access to data and systems during this process. But if you don't mind, I'll, I'll cover that down a couple of slides. Yeah, I don't mind. And, and, and out of the two groups that you just mentioned too, are you also considering uh, folks who may not be direct employees, but are contracted, contracted third parties too, that may have that Absolutely. type of access? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. I'll keep on trucking here. So a little bit about the process, because you may not be, you know, um, um, super aware of how this process works. And I, I don't like to reinvent the wheel. So I stole this graphic from Gartner but I added in the little light blue bubbles under here. So, you know, a typical M&A process is that, you know, there is a discovery and targeting process. And just so you don't think that this is totally theoretical, we at Trace3 just did a big acquisition of a company called Set Solutions based in Houston. And I was part of the deal team um, to take them through this entire process. So really, you know, firsthand knowledge and and really recent knowledge. So during this sort of like, you know, um, discovery period, you know, most mature organizations will consider the broader technology environment of that potential acquisition, as well as their security posture. 
And, and the reason why is that um, the the potential acquiree could have um, an extremely incompatible or poor technology environment or very bad security environment. For example, do you want to acquire a company that just had a major security breach? Maybe, maybe not. Um, or do you want to acquire a company that uses completely disparate technology and applications that you use? I don't know. You you might. They might be strategic enough for you, but you ought to be thinking about that in the you know buy decision as to what that you know downstream work effort is going to be. And then as you start doing the deal, this is where you're valuing them. You start to do your due diligence. You know, you're negotiating things like that. It, it's really critical that that the IT and security team is involved during this execution phase, um, understanding the impact of bringing in new technology architecture and, and the security controls that they have, if, if they have them, um, and how the two organizations will relate is really critical. Um, I had a conversation with a chief strategy officer at one of my organizations where I was the CISO and actually I was the interim CIO um, for about a year. And um, I was trying to impart the importance of understanding this in advance of making a final offer, because if there is a million dollars worth of remediation that has to be done or more, you'll want to bake that into the deal. There, there, There's a serious opportunity to, during the due diligence phase, to influence that, that negotiation based on what their technology looks like, what their security program looks like. And then the last phase is you, you've done the deal. Now you're trying to go out and realize those synergies and things like that. Well, realizing synergies often relies on the effort and engagement of the security team during execution. If they're a hot mess over there, you, you know, you could end up spending millions of dollars to remediate the acquiry security program or buy technology or extend licensing to really make them even a, a safe environment to integrate and, and operate. And so I'll put the source on here um, because I, I, I don't, I'm not a plagiarist. Um, I did grab this from Gartner in March of 2022. They published um, this flow chart. So I'll pause for a second. Any questions or comments about the, the typical M&A process? If, if nobody else okay. does, I, I, I do have questions. I was hoping somebody Please. else would ask questions besides me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just one statement. I, I couldn't help but thinking about the Yahoo deal um, when Yahoo was acquired and then realized they um, had hidden that they had a what, 500 million record breach, uh, which dropped their valuation, but it was after negotiations that already happened. Um, so that's, that just one of the stress, like, just kind of like the importance of what you were saying is really, you've got to have that involvement early on before closing to discover all these potential pitfalls and, and negotiate the price, especially if it's in your advantage too. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's why I, I just wanted to hop in. Oh, and the other question I had too, and, and maybe you, you'll address this at, at a different slide too, I may be getting ahead of things, is do you see a difference between when uh, M&A is occurring for a public company with another public company, publicly held company, uh, where there's the board, board and stockholders who often have to be answered to versus a private company uh, going through and acquiring another company where there's no board that has to be answered to. Uh, would you, uh, have you had that experience, I guess, been involved in those kinds of deals? And would would you say there'd be less potential involvement of a CISO, CIO level um, and their organization uh, because of the less oversight that you have with a publicly held company? Yeah, it's a great question. I actually don't talk about that nuance um, specifically later on. So maybe just a, a few words about it now. Um, I, I guess uh, I guess theoretically, public to public, you you would have some more confidence, you know, in what is being told to you. They they are accountable to to shareholders. They typically, you know, have to disclose um, you know, breaches and things like that. Whereas a private company, um, you know, may be able to hold those things closer to the vest. What, what I would say though, in either circumstance, it's the old buyer beware, um, caveat. And, and I'm, I'm going to talk about some, some methods, um, to try and interject some objectivity 
you know, into that due diligence. So it's one thing to say that, you know, we we have a really secure environment and you say, okay, great, that sounds good. Let's do the deal. Um, but there are some ways to to kind of get a more objective viewpoint on that. And, and I'm going to be talking about that shortly. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. I'm going to keep going here. So some of these major considerations to think about um, are, are, are going to be on here. You know, most security teams allocate team members to focus on each of these areas. It, it's very easy to um, get distracted from your day job if you are pulled off and, and asked to do, um, you know, specific tasks around an acquisition. So um, the best practice is really to allocate people from the security team to focus on these while the rest of the team is um, continuing to maintain the security operations of, of the day-to-day -day business. So first of all, um, you know, not rocket science, right? Hopefully you, you've already figured this part out is, is initiating due diligence early. You know, you are significantly handicapped if you um, are pulled in, you know, a week before the deal is finalized, right? Your ability to influence um, the, the deal price, um, post-close, um, you know, considerations, you know, is very, very much hampered if you're not brought into the deal early. So really, you know, being, you know, at the very beginning of that sort of discovery, you know, um, um, contemplation phase is really the best practice. Um, something that a lot of teams don't think about, but you really should freeze any new processes or security investment while you're going through one of these transactions. And, you know, why I say that is um, you don't, necessarily know everything that the acquiree organization has in flight or what they have in production. And so you may be putting in, let's say, for example, a brand new, um, you know, incident to ticketing process, right? And you're really, really proud of it. Um, but your incident to ticket ticketing process is, is, you know, directly in conflict with your acquiree's process. Oh, and by the way, their process is pretty good. Like you might, you may want to adopt their process instead of creating a second process. Then the two are going to have to be harmonized and rationalized. You know, same thing with security investment. Like, let's say you're getting ready to dump your existing, you know, endpoint EDR solution. Like you've had it for years. It's legacy. You know, you're sick of it. You've been out doing some some POCs, and you're really excited about the new technology that's out there. Um, but I would I would advise against making that purchase um, until you fully understand what your acquiree security investments are. Um, they may have some preferred licensing um, that you can take advantage of, um, or the two combined companies could take advantage of of better pricing um, once you're together. Um, or you might be getting ready to buy that new EDR solution. And your acquiree company has worked with them for years and thinks that they're garbage. <laughs> so that that might be, you know, influential in your decision to decide to move forward. So I, I just say think about, you know, not being very aggressive during this activity. Um, people are super important through this process. So I, I identify key staff and and put in place retention efforts, you know, where they're necessary. Like. You don't want to lose, um, you know, your security operations manager, you know, during this process because um, he, he he or she has heard through the grapevine that um, you're now going to outsource security operations once you, um, you know, bring on the new company. So I can't overemphasize, you know, the importance of, of you know, staying close to your people and making sure that um, you have a game plan for them. Um, you know, map out ongoing security operations. So I alluded to this earlier, it's easy to get distracted. Um, it's easy to kind of say, yeah, you know, we're kind of running on auto autopilot with our identity program. We don't really need to, you know, spend too much time around that, but you, you really need to sit down and say, okay, you know, we've got X number of people on our security team, you know, out of those X number of people, you know, you, you three are gonna really, stay on top of what we're doing for identity and for our, um, you know, sec, uh, our security operations center, you know, things like that. And then you two are going to come over here and really spend most of your time 
you know, on the M&A effort. Map, map it out, like be deliberate about it. Um, so this is an opportunity often when you're doing an acquisition to leverage technology tools to evaluate the acquiree. And so this is, um, this is the point that I was uh, deferring to a, a little bit earlier. Um, you know, there are some great tools out there and I'm not going to sit here and name drop them. Um, but you should really try and influence um, the deal team to allow you to install um, and or run some technology tools against the acquiree so that you can get objective data on what their environment looks like. Talk is cheap. Um, attestation reports like SOC 2 type 2s, you know, are point in time. Um, if they give you their last pen test report, once again, point in time. Um, so what I would recommend is if, if you're able to make this happen, um, and I'm happy to talk about it. I just don't want to offer it up without, you know, being asked, um, you know, but but there are tools you can install, um, you know, in the acquiry or target environment um, to, to get some data that's objective. Um, okay. Second point that I stuck a pin in was around enhanced monitoring on privileged users and sensitive data. So, you know, this is a very sensitive time for both organizations. So whether you're the acquirer or the acquiree, you'll want to really enhance monitoring around your most privileged users. And that's not just technical people. Um, you know, you want to be watching the CFO, you want to be watching, you, you know, the HR people, um, you'll want to be watching certainly the, the database administrators um, and other, you know, key application administrators. Um, and then where are those sensitive data sets? Not that you're not always having enhanced, you know, monitoring around these, but you want to be hyper-focused on what's happening in these environments during this M&A transaction. Seek out opportunities to rationalize. So another reason to be involved in the deal is that oftentimes the business folks don't really realize that there, are, there could be some serious cost savings. So, um, you know, I was in a situation where um, we were doing an acquisition and they were um, they were getting ready, and this was a couple of years ago, so you can tell my information is a little dated, but they were getting ready to go over to Office 365, but hadn't yet. And and the pricing that they were getting was pretty poor, uh, but, but we are a much larger organization. Um, and so we were able to rationalize out, you know, their existing technology there. Um, you know, they may be using legacy technology. Um, let, let's say that they're on, you know, some sort of, you know, old firewall. Well, you might be able to move that out and extend, you know, either a hardware, or software, um, firewall environment to to their environment. Um, so, so you know, this is truly a case of where one plus one should equal one and a half. <laughs> you know, you hear one plus one equals three a lot, but but I would what I would say is look for opportunities to gain efficiencies from a technology perspective. Um, you know, you may be able to move from, you know, 40, 50, 60 security tools to maybe 40 between the two organizations. And there's a lot of cost savings there. And then the last one is just really uh, around increasing threat analysis. So I think I've covered all of those, you know, uh, stick a pin points, um, and we'll get into a little more detail in the coming slides, but you certainly want to increase threat analysis. Um, I, I think I have a quote on the next slide from the FBI that talks about, um, organizations that are going through this activity are, are really at a heightened state for bad actors um, because you're never more vulnerable than when you're either looking to acquire a company or you're looking to be acquired because you are so vulnerable with the IP that you have and the deal details and things like that. So you'll want to really increase your threat analysis. So there, there's more detail on, on, you know, I have a couple more slides, but any questions or comments on this one? Okay. I will keep going. Everybody probably went to the beer fridge by now. Um, so what are, what are some of the major considerations? Um, so in the due diligence phase, you know, you want to think like a business person you want to convince the CFO and others that information security is an important part of the deal. Um, if they have weak or non-existent security controls, you can use that information to negotiate a lower cost for the deal. And you'll want to make sure that you're budgeting to implement the tools and controls needed to secure the environment during their transition into your organization. 
you know, let's assume, for example, and I, I kind of use this compliance example, let's say you're acquiring a, a service provider organization, but it's yet to achieve its SOC 2 certification. Well, assuming the industry average costs in, achi in achieving SOC 2 is about 100 grand, you'll want to factor in this cost to uh, the negotiation in the pricing for the acquisition. You don't want to be surprised by the fact that, oh, oh, oh my gosh, all of a sudden we have to now pay for that um, because, because they hadn't you know quite factored that into the cost. So your dil diligence team should be asking questions like this. You know, what does the cyber risk profile of the target look like? You know, you should be basing this based on a, you know, trusted set of security standards like NIST, CIS, ISO 27K, et cetera. You know, what does the cybersecurity and privacy compliance regulations, what are they that that target organization must maintain? I've been in, involved in some of these activities where it was an unregulated entity acquiring a regulated entity, and they had no idea of the amount of expense and administrative overhead that that the regulation and compliance um, requirements, you know, were going to cost. What will be the cost to bring the MA target cybersecurity, privacy, and compliance posture to acceptable or compliance levels? I alluded to this earlier. Um, you know, is it is it you know a hundred thousand dollars? Is it five million dollars? I mean, those are important questions to to ask and get answered before the deal is done. You know, have they experienced a recent cyber attack or data breach? You know, this must be met with qualitative analysis of the reputational damage that the target, you know, may carry over. Um, you know, if you're if you're looking at three different targets and one of them has recently had a breach, well, that might be, you know, uh, an impactful part of your decision making process. Um, you have to ask the question. So, you know, you asked me earlier, um, you know, uh, what what compels them to disclose it? Well, if it's not public knowledge, um, I guess nothing compels them. But if you ask the question and they're not truthful about it, you may have some um, you know additional options available to you if you find out about it post breach. You know, legal types of things, um, things that you can get you know um, money back on the deal. Um, I've seen that kind of built into some deals where they they put a clause into the the legalese that says if we discover, you know, undisclosed um, issues post close, you know, we have an option to revoke the deal, or we have an option to recoup, you know, certain monies um, to remediate the issues. And then what's the delta um, that should be negotiated based on this analysis that's conducted? You know, this could be, for example, the original M and A cost minus the cost to mitigate. Um, some of these issues is is the new deal cost. So, you know, you can really become a, a really valuable and important part of the business team by asking these questions and providing this data back. I mean, you could save the CFO and the chief strategy officer and others millions, you know, by just asking these questions and providing this sort of information doing the doing during the due diligence phase. So let me pause for a second. Any questions here? I'm I'm almost done. I swear. I think I have two more slides. Well, um, I did have a question. Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Um. So, would an example of like due diligence maybe be like a pen test? Is is it okay to say like you're required to do these things before we continue with the deal? That would in absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know that that's one tactic you can use is is to ask them to provide one or or ask them if if you can do one. You know, let us bring our pen testing firm um, to bear. Um, and let us see what results we get, you know, um, and I mentioned the technology side of it. Um, you know, I've been successful and I've been unsuccessful uh, um, in, in being able to install some technology into the actual environment to look at traffic and to, to look for vulnerabilities. Any qu other question? I hope that answered your question, Megan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On the, uh, on, on your third bullet point there, um, I just want to thank you for bringing up that it's not only cybersecurity, but it's privacy as well. I'm just thinking of the global stage, right, is that if you're uh, the company acquiring another company and they have um, data that's, say, in the EU region, because that's always the easy one to pick on, right, is the GDPR stuff. Well, now you're taking on that responsibility uh, that they they already have or should have, <laughs> hopefully, uh, that they're they're doing good at the compliance for GDPR. Um, 
but that you're taking that on now and the work that that entails uh, when you inquire them, because now you have to reach out to those customers and say, now you're the controller or the processor, depending on where you're at in that ecosystem, right? So that's that's more cost too that you're 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 going to now bear the brunt of. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, there's so many moving parts here that you know a lot of times, the the senior business people they see dollar signs, right? They see market share. Um, they say they they see you know the the they see way down the road of the combined organizations, but they don't see some of these short-term things that are, that are hugely impactful like that. Yeah. Greg here in chat okay. says, says uh, don't just blindly accept their choice of pen testing vendor. Use your own that you trust. I, I agree. I agree. I, I, if you're able to make it happen, use your own and then also try and get your own technology put into their environment to, to provide some objective data. Yeah. So I, I guess that goes towards my next question then too is, is, as part of your findings, are you doing a, a, something that's really hard for a lot of companies to do is are you doing asset discovery and inventorying as, as not only for your regular typical, typical infrastructure, but also uh, potentially data discovery too? Yeah, absolutely. You can't secure what you don't know you have. And, and just like you as the acquirer, it's important to understand what technology assets the acquiree has. You know, it's right. that weakest link in the chain, right? Like, there could be something in, and I don't want to insult anybody from Pigs Knuckle, Arkansas, but, you know, if your acquiree company, you know, has a branch in Pigs Knuckle, Arkansas, where it's like the wild, wild west and everything's wide open, you know, you want to know that before you connect them to your network. <laughs> I, I did have a question. This is Shannon. I, I guess that sort of answers my question. I, my, um, I was just trying to, I was curious if um, industry of the acquiree plays a factor um, so I would think if you're, let's say, requiring a fintech company as opposed to maybe like a, a marketing research or um, or even just a, a real tel retail shop of sorts, maybe that might also play a factor in, in the process. I'm just curious from that side or, or to get your insight from that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mean, you know, if you're acquiring a, um, you know, a one office um, you know, uh, intellectual property shop, right? Like, like you said, I'll, I'll just use your example. Like, let's say they're an advertising agency or, or a marketing company and they're based in New York city and they have one office and, uh, you know, all of their IP is kept in, you know, in Azure in one container and, you know, that's it. Right. Okay. Well, that's one scenario, you know, not terribly complex to evaluate, um, you know, their security program, um, take take that as you know against a, a you know multinational global conglomerate that um, manufactures smoke detectors, but also does you know IT consulting, um, and they have operations in you know all over the world, right? I mean, totally different scenarios, and um, you know obviously that 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 second scenario you know requires a ton more due diligence and a ton more up, upstream attention. No, that. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Sure, Shannon. Thank you for the question. Okay, I'll keep trucking here. So some of the threats to manage, and and again, this is a lot of this is not rocket science. Um, but but you know the statement here at the top, you know mo most experts um, really believe is that M and A activity piques the interest of bad actors and actually elevates the chance of human error. So the FBI published um, a private industry notification warning, and this is a quote from their warning. Ransomware actors use significant financial events and stock valuations to facilitate targeting and extortion of victims. So the public realization of a breach could derail an M&A deal, making ransom or extortion payment a much more attractive option. You know, these transactions by nature create more sensitive, more proprietary information that is ripe for theft or threat of theft. And so... Um, in addition to the external threat, which is significant, insider threats are also elevated because um, ultimately there are always some disgruntled employees on both sides, the, the acquirer and the acquiree, you know, or some privileged users that could potentially take advantage of distracted IT and security teams to steal sensitive information. And, and there's a lot of examples of this. Um, you know, the last bit is around human error. I mean, we know in the security business that human error is probably one of the greatest, you know, um, exposures to, to, you know, breaches, you know, whether you're clicking on a phishing email, 
um, or you're deploying, you know, vulnerable code that's internet facing, um, you know, human error is more prevalent when two organizations and two different architectures are being consolidated. The control points and normal operations are often neglected or, or incompatible. So, you know, this is the human side of it, both external and in internal. Um, and so, you know, from an external perspective, you need to really be, you know, have your guard up, um, be, you know, be, be really enhancing, um, you know, that, that threat analysis. And, and then, you know, on the in inside, you really need to be, you know, enhancing the monitoring, um, not only of people that might be malicious, but just of human error. You know, you want to be extra diligent you know, in your, your code deployment and your development, you know, uh, of externally facing applications and systems during this process, because the person who is maybe, you know, um, you know, deploying the new application, you know, to the internet, you know, may have been also asked to, at the same time, evaluate, you know, the app dev, you know, capabilities of the target company. And so, you know, there, there are just natural distractions that happen. Um, so I have recommendations here, and I think that's really it. We can wrap up with some, you know, questions or comments or dialogue. So, so you know, these are, these are exciting, you know, periods of time for any organization. I'm not trying to be like a downer around it. I mean, most of the times these are very positive events um, for both companies, but, but they do introduce risk and complexity. And so, you know, the M&A teams, and I'm talking about the business teams, right? They should be involving the IT and security teams early in the process. You know, they need to stay focused on existing security operations and controls and avoid distractions. They need to quickly identify these new third-party relationships and the associated risk management needs. So hopefully, you know, you as the, you know, acquirer, you have a good handle on your third-party relationships and and you know interactions with your your organization's IT but what are the third party relationships that the acquiree has and um you know are those going to introduce additional risk are they working with a vendor that you've de deemed to be high risk you want to bubble that up you want to raise that you know through the due diligence process and and, and if the deal is going to go through no matter what you're going to want to make sure that you have extra controls extra monitoring extra oversight you know, over any of those third-party relationships that you may deem to be higher risk. Um, identify and mitigate new vulnerabilities associated with the inquiry. I mean, that kind of goes into the like, no kidding, you know, category. But, you know, making sure that you have a way of post-close understanding what those vulnerabilities are. Um, I'm sorry, pre-close what those vulnerabilities are. And then, you know, during the transition process, how are you um, mitigating those vulnerabilities, remediating those vulnerabilities so that when you get into post-close, you know, they don't um, present, you know, undue risk to the organization. I mean, can you imagine a scenario where, you know, you acquire a new company and like, you know, the second day, um, something from their environment infects, you know, both organizations and, and, you know, it would be, you know, horrific from a reputation perspective and, and potentially from a financial perspective. Um, you want to use the transaction as an opportunity to rationalize and consolidate legacy tools. I mean, the reason why a company is being acquired sometimes is just because they're smaller um, and the scale that's being gained. But sometimes it's because um, they're not keeping up with their technology and, and they can't afford to maybe. You know, they may not be able to do the things that the acquiree organization can do. So you want to be keenly aware of not only their security tooling, but their overall IT tooling. You know, what are they using for email? What are they using for data storage? What are they doing? Are they doing anything in the cloud versus on-premise? You know, you need to really understand all of that and, and look for ways to rationalize and, and consolidate. And then, um, you know, I think this is my last one, be aware of morale issues that that could create insider risks. Again, don't, don't underestimate the anxiety that employees on both sides are are feeling during this process. Now, some of them may not be impacted whatsoever, um, but whole departments may be going away as a result of this. And so, you know, they know they're not dumb. They they even though these things are are usually pretty tightly held to the vest, um, things leak out, and and you know, employees usually know when there's an acquisition happening on both sides. So be, be keenly aware of that human factor. And that's it.
that's all I have. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, if there's any questions, feel free to, to ask them now or type so, them yeah, back. <laughs> Brian, thanks so much for, for doing this. I had a question. You, you mentioned being called into the last, the last uh, part of the M&A. At, at your level and as what you've seen, what are like the top three or five things that you would want to look at at the very last, you know, the last part of the goal line, getting over the, the goal yard line? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, it, you know, when you get pulled into that situation, I guess the first thing I ask is, hey, do you have any third party attestations, um, recent pen tests, um, recent vulnerability scans, um, you know, outputs from, um, you know, your SIM or from your incident response ticketing system that you'd be willing to share? Um, you know, those things are typically pretty objective. And, you know, probably any one of us could look at those things, you know, quickly and determine whether they've got their act together or whether it, you know, it's a total mess. So I would do those things. Um, I would at the very least, you know, ask for some interview time with some of the, the key stakeholders over there. Like, hey, let me talk to their security leader or let me talk to their network administrator or let me talk to their, you know, person um, over there that, that kind of runs the stuff. And, and through kind of an interview um, you know, discussion, you can probably unearth, you know, again, whether there are major issues or, you know, things seem to be pretty squared away. So those are kind of last minute things that I, that I would do. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. I got a question here from Joe in chat, uh, wondering what are your top three choices for deal room software these days? Deal room software. Um, are you talking about where, like information is stored and shared with the deal team to review? Or are you talking about things I would install into a target company's environment to objectively evaluate the controls? That's due, due diligence. diligence docs. Yep, you got it. Uh, I think we've been using Boardroom, I think is the name of it. Um, and uh, I'm just blanking because we just went through this, you know, with the company we acquired. If you don't mind, um, I'm happy to, I'm happy to, you know, it's easy to kind of Google these sorts of things, but let me let me get um, the information either through Megan to you or you're welcome to hit me up on LinkedIn if you want. And I'll tell you what we use um, that we're really happy with. I'm just blanking on it right now. I apologize. I'll, I'll go to voice here. Brian, first, uh, great coverage uh, there this evening. I've been through a few of these M&A deals on both sides of the desk and you covered it quite well. Uh, the reason I'm asking about the deal room software is sort of a softball to you there to talk about the security of those things because you're now outsourcing and perhaps the most sensitive part of the deal in the due diligence process, you're passing documents back and forth. You have to track who looks at what, mm -hmm. how long, why, did they edit it, did they not edit it, uh, did they make a local copy of it, et cetera, and all those details but you also have to secure those documents. So for the rest of the folks, it's something to really think about is how you manage the due diligence docs during that process. And these tools come and go, and I don't know who the current Vogue winner is. And thanks for your answer. Yeah, I, um, maybe if we're talking um, after the questions, I'm gonna search, I can search through my inbox and I can figure it out. I do know that we use a secure repository you have to be specifically granted access. We don't email documents around about it. And, and so, and I know that it is a reputable one that we use because I've used it at other companies. So I'll ferret around in my inbox and maybe I can get you that answer real time here. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. We actually had a situation where that the service we were using was breached. Oh man. You know, so just again, the note, uh, security has to roll downhill and, you know, make sure you know who you're doing business with there. And by the way, I appreciate the softball. It, un unfortunately, it was like a hardball that hit me straight in the face. So I, I apologize. I, I wish I had the answer on the tip of my tongue. No worries. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm kidding. It's interesting, Joe, because you touched on that, knowing who you're dealing with and, and even the software or the services that you're, you're dealing with. Because I, I think that was mentioned there, Brian, I think you mentioned it too, is when you're the acquirer and you're 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 doing all the discovery and stuff with the acquiree is um they may not have as good of vendor management uh going on as you do or, or may see their risk differently. I think you even said that uh 
there was uh, they may be doing dealing with a company that you see is already as high risk and is not on your list uh, of folks to do uh, do business with. Um, so yeah, just looking at uh, vendor management and, and risk uh, processes that the other company is doing to kind of get insight there too. Yep. Yeah, great point. But, and, you know, we talked a lot about security, you know, cybersecurity, privacy, uh, and whatnot, and, and insider threat, which I really appreciate an answering that question uh, a few slides later. Uh, that, that was perfect because that's something uh, we're hearing a lot, not only the third party or supply chain risk, right, right, but we're hearing a lot of third party, about third party risk or um, insider risk too. Um, and I'm just thinking there's also the financial uh, insider risk, right? There's the uh, insider trading, a trading that can occur uh, because people know a deal's coming, so they're gonna, they may sell off stock or buy stock. You know, if it's a publicly traded company, uh, maybe you know some people don't realize that that's an issue. Uh, maybe uh, the training program that's available inside the company, because generally being having come from a public company, that was training we got all the time. Was be, you know be aware if this is already public information, you can't trade on it. You can't you know let somebody else know so they can trade on it, right? But uh, you know if there's not an awareness, then there's that danger that that risk that can exist because of that. Yeah, and you know. Um... Sometimes, depending on um, who you are acquiring, you're you're usually you know gathering data you know about the acquiree, right? Like you're not usually putting a lot of your data out there, and and, and so I think, and I don't know why I'm just not finding it. Um, I might have like archived it or something, but um, a lot of times the the acquiree's company's representative will own you know that repository. Sometimes it's like a law firm. Firm. Sometimes it's a private equity firm. Sometimes it's a, you know, bank. Um, so you you may or may not um, have the ability to influence that um, because they they kind of control that because they're the representative of the acquiry. Good point. Yeah. While we're while we're waiting for for additional questions, <laughs> I was th when you were talking about the making sure that the kind of the I'm paraphrasing a bit now is that that make sure the little things still get keep keep getting done, keep getting addressed. Uh, that don't fall fall away as as people focus on uh, the M and A side of things and, and having having dedicated personnel to do it is is certainly better um, because people have their day jobs they have their responsibility to take care. Of. I'm just thinking of the the major acquisition of the overvalued company that we all know of as Twitter, uh, right? Is um, <laughs> the firing or letting go of of key team members uh, at that company. Uh, and things kind of falling apart because of that, um, you know, knowing <laughs> knowing who has um, what responsibilities and, and uh, how those may impact the company if they're no longer there. Uh, think of a real simple example would be certificates, as, as, as a lot of us know, if you got certificates that are expiring that need to be renewed yearly, you're on some periodic schedule. And the person who normally does that or the team that normally does that is now gone. I, well, what do you do? Right. Um, so there, there's you know, just a just being aware of people's responsibilities uh, and taking care of the the little things, making sure that everything keeps getting done uh, is, is a good thing to also focus on or maintain that focus, right? And, and Mike, I'll jump in. And, uh, Brian, you had the chart up there from Gartner earlier and you asked for questions on that. It was, it's not really a question, but an observation. And the Twitter thing reminded me of it because I was going to make a snarky comment at the time. But uh, <laughs> sometimes on that chart, it's not a linear process. It's a loop, right? Like that middle section. And uh, in the case of Twitter is a great example. Uh, he got into due diligence. He found out the number of bots. He did his calculations on the basis of for which he was spending the money he was spending to buy the company was based on a certain number of users, et cetera. And when he found out that was actually not accurate, um, he wanted to renegotiate the deal. So that, that deal sort of went back to the beginning. And in that process, uh, yeah, there you go. That middle section, um, yeah, do the deal part, M&A transaction execution. And sometimes that does go back to the beginning and to reevaluation. You know what I mean? Yep. And I don't I don't know if I, I I can't speak to a security impact of that. It's just the nature of the deal sometimes that happens. Well, these can be grueling and tiring exercises. You know, you'll often find the deal teams, you know, go on like a hiatus after these things close because, you know, there's a lot of 
there are a lot of long days and nights associated with these. And, and I guess maybe one implication is if, you know, if this loops back um, or you end up, you know, squashing a deal and then you bring in like a brand new, uh, you know, somebody who was in second place, you know, to be the acquiree and, and you just start going again, there can be a lot of fatigue, you know, involved in that. So again, it's kind of that human factor of staying close to your team you know, having dedicated resources to do this. And you may even have to swap out resources um, because how many, you know, 24 hour days can you do um, in a row? It's kind of like during a, an incident, you know, or a breach, um, you know, you've, you've got to have a plan in place to shuttle um, and, and swap out team members because when, once people start to get fatigued, like in any business, you know, your, your judgment gets impaired and you make mistakes and, and all of that. So it's a really good point you bring up. Yeah. And I want to add on to Joe, what Joe was saying is uh, from the iteration point, um, doing that and, the, and do the deal. I'm just thinking too, um, even before that, uh, the, my previous employer, uh, was a publicly traded company and at a certain point, uh, there was a company tried to acquire them. And it became very public uh, through the point of there were at least three public offering offerings made um, that were rebutted. To the, and then the company tried to do a hostile takeover with the um, going going to the stockholders and getting votes and stuff. So that's uh, that's another aspect to consider too, because then things get really public and employees get really worn down because of it, because um, your stocks could be going up and down and. Um, people don't know what's going to be happening. So you've got the unknown that starts playing into the psychology of things. Uh, yeah. So there's, uh, even before you get to, to, to the, that middle part, I think certainly there's, there's other times where like an extreme example, like what I was involved with, uh, could occur that could have similar impacts and bring, and bring those dangers too, because now you've got employees not knowing. So now they may have motive, uh, to be that insider threat. No public confessions, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Well, thank you for the uh, LinkedIn invites. I've gotten quite a few. I was just checking, just just accepting as I was going through there. So it's nice to nice to meet all of you. I'm happy to stay connected on LinkedIn. And if you have any, you know, questions or whatever, feel free to DM me and you know things like that. And uh, and you know, Megan and I work together pretty cl closely, so uh, she can always hit me up as well. But I really appreciate the time and the opportunity. It's nice to meet all of you and. Um, if you need, uh, if you need somebody to take up, uh, 45 minutes on your agenda down the road, let me know, I can come up with a different topic. Yeah, certainly. We appreciate your time, the presentation and sharing your knowledge tonight. It's been really interesting. And, and Megan, thank you for helping set that up. Uh, as, as I forgot to announce at the beginning, Megan is our co-organizer for Southwest Florida SEC. So a uh, big round of applause for her too, getting this set up for us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna head. I'm gonna drop off, but uh, thank you all so much. And again, let's stay in touch. All right, yeah, thank thanks, you. Brian. Okay, bye bye. Yeah.